Hello and greetings from UB. On behalf of the Office of Alumni Engagement and the UB School of Management, we are very delighted you are able to join us for today's webinar presentation. My name is Christy Fields and I manage the Alumni Careers and Lifelong Learning Program here at UB. We are so grateful you are able to join us today and we hope you and your family are staying well. It is my honor to welcome today's featured presenter, Dr. Christiane Tiu. Christiane is the Chair of the Department of Finance Associate Professor of Finance and the current Academic Director of the MBA program at UB. He is also a member of the Investment Committee of the University of Buffalo Foundation, an 800 plus million university endowment and an academic advisor to Gerstein Fisher, a People's Bank investment company. Christiane is an expert in endowment management, including aspects related to governance, compensation, integration with the university, as well as investments, and he's consulted for a variety of dedicated organizations. He is also a member of the American Finance Association, the Western Finance Association, the Association of Governing Boards of Universities and Colleges, and a TIAA Institute Fellow. In this session, Christiane will address a few of the effects of the crises on performance of investment managers, on personal finances, as well as on higher education. We will leave some time during today's webinar for Q&A. If you have any questions during today's presentation, please submit them through your GoToWebinar taskbar, the question section on your screen, and you can simply chat those to us at any time. In addition, we will be recording today's session and we will send you all a copy within the next 24 hours. With that said, it's my pleasure to turn it over to one of my colleagues here at UB, our featured presenter, Dr. Christiane Tiu. Well, thank you, Christy. And, uh... Uh, UB friends uh, out there. Um, I know that uh, the timing is uh, uh, maybe, um, uh, I, I guess, a bit tight. Um, I think news about the vaccine are supposed to happen maybe on CNN. So, so I'm sure that you'll be checking, I guess, those news and, uh, uh, and then I'll basically be going through the slides. Uh, the other challenge for this presentation is that uh, this is a fluid, um, this crisis is very fluid and uh, things change basically from one week to another. So uh, committing actually to do a presentation on this crisis uh, and delivering the presentations basically may be um, a, a very different things. But I hope I'll say something to some degree interesting and then something that you probably haven't seen. Um, and, um, um, and then with that, actually, I'm, um, um, I'm, I'm going to launch into my uh, presentation. Um, I, I just want to start actually with an overview of what is going on. Um, so I have uh, PhD students who uh, currently work in China and uh, I was born in Romania and as such I've been glued to the COVID crisis pretty much since the mid-January of, um, uh, of this year uh, and then I've seen it unfold uh, first in China um, uh, especially through talking with my student, um, and uh, second in Europe uh, through watching the news um, from um, uh, from from Romania, um, and then so I've been basically exposed to it. Um, I think much longer than I've been exposed to it in the U.S. I I became exposed to to it in the U.S. <clears throat> I think starting in March, like everybody else. Um, um, when I uh, then started to uh, quarantine, I guess once the university um, moved its uh, activity online. Um, and then it's obviously uh, a relatively interesting time. So if you're looking at what happened, I guess, in, in the US, so you can see that somewhere in mid-March, if you can actually watch my cursor, uh, we've started seeing, I guess, cases of um, <clears throat> of uh, infections with coronavirus in in the US and then markets then basically precipitously dropped um, and then to some degree they've recovered and I'm going to talk actually uh, a bit more about um, about these market movements um, as, um, as as I go actually with my uh, with my presentation um, the government responded uh, and then the response was uh, uh, very swift in some respect, <clears throat> uh, especially the response to keep the economy afloat. <clears throat> uh, 
was large and uh, I guess unprecedented actually in, ter in, in terms of size uh, and definitely timely. Um, if you look at the liquidity reserves that the Federal Reserve decided to use to uh, basically buy assets in markets and, and generally make markets more liquid. And then if you add that with the CARES package that the government uh, 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 put out there, um, you'll, you'll basically get nearly 20% actually of the uh, gross domestic product of the United States. So in terms of size, um, that, that is very large. And I think government around the world are trying to do the same thing. I think Japan, uh, uh, basically, in terms of magnitude, um, uh, the, their response is close to our, to our response. Uh, and then, essentially, this is something that is very different uh, than, uh, I guess, what we were doing in um, the 1920s, uh, where I think the view was, well, you don't have, actually, to help the economy. You can basically allow, essentially, the rot to purge. I think somebody was famously uh, saying uh, uh, back then, um, and, and then of course, uh, if you do that, then the economic um, uh, effects are uh, hard to bear, um, especially for ordinary people uh, living in that economy. So, so we're taking the Keynesian approach, we're, we're basically um, pumping money into the economy and then hoping that uh, this will help the economy uh, survive as consumers are not able to. Um, um, uh, do the same thing. Um, I want to take a little bit of time and comment on what is it that could happen. Unfortunately, this is uh, it's a health crisis. We've seen crises like this before, um, uh, and I'm talking about the Spanish flu, specifically in um, 1919. Um, uh, but this is something new. Medicine has changed. The response of governments have changed. Um, and then so the history is not such a precise indicator, actually, uh, uh, of the future, uh, as, as I guess we, we would like it to be. Um, I, I'm going to basically give the, the bleakest sort of scenario here, and, and then the best case scenario. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about um, where is it that um, I think work uh, currently positioned um, in between these scenarios. Uh, what I, th I think somewhat far from the worst case scenario, and then we're somewhat far actually from the best case scenario, probably we're farther away from the worst case scenario than from the best. Um, so, so I guess on average, it's sort of a positive, um, um, you know, place, I think, between these two. So the worst case scenario, um, that happens, I guess, with any crisis in, the, in, in an economy. So think about that um, in the production process, I guess in general, you, you take natural resources, you take labor, and you take capital, and then you put them together, and then, um, then you have um, firms, I guess, putting this together and, and manufacturing, I don't know, widgets or whatever they're manufacturing. Um, and um, and then basically then these things are uh, traded and sold and uh, and capital is essentially a claim on um, on um, on these firms and um, or on the shares basically of the let's say consumption good that these firms create and um, the uh, in the worst case scenario uh, productivity is essentially in the economy drops so for example because everybody is uh, unable to work because um, I, in a health crisis they're sick um, and uh, then the output of firms basically becomes so small that if the firms were to sell their products and pay their workers the salary that the workers will receive will be under a reservation wage, for example, under what you can um, um, calculate you need to eat and pay your rent and, uh, and, and then, I don't know, live your life. Um, and then so in that case, then, um, then um, uh, the product, that production process has to stop and uh, then capital is no longer needed, obviously, because uh, everybody then uh, reverts to, let's say, work in the back of uh, the houses on, on the gardens or, or something like that. Uh, and then so uh, the, the market obviously precipitously fall, falls and um, 
uh, at the same time, volatility as this market decline is taking place, volatility shoots up a lot. And, and then the market price basically become of equity becomes not necessarily zero, it becomes something uh, that is relatively small, uh, primarily because there is some restarting of the economy actually that is priced in. Now, obviously, um, um, uh, this is uh, horribly extreme, I would say. I, I don't think we are there at all. Um, and uh, it could actually be done, made even worse in terms of economic scenarios. So besides this decline, um, uh, you also have inflation, right? So we, have, we were lucky to some degree that we have not observed that much inflation in the US uh, uh, currently. But on the other hand, um, the, what happens to the meat industry, for example, uh, and then what happens with some of the um, um, I mean, supply chains, uh, makes it so that prices um, on, on some goods go up and, and then that makes inflation actually uh, a creep in a little bit, right? So, so the worst case scenario is essentially um, inflation coupled with uh, economic decline, right? So that's the scenario of stagflation. I don't think we're there. Um, and we're somewhat far from there, obviously. Um, and the best case scenario is um, we understand at least about coronaviruses. We've worked with coronaviruses before uh, from, from the SARS and, and MERS uh, cases. And, and then I think these things were floating around, they were studied. So hopefully we can understand how to make antiviral viral drugs. Maybe we can understand how to make a vaccine. Um, and then uh, the healthcare industry responds to this crisis um, with, with its best basically foot forward. Um, so we solve it. We knew also that viruses are a threat to the humankind, uh, one of the biggest. And, and then this is an illustration that uh, humankind can, can sort of get together and, and then resolve these massive problems. Um, and then so we'll have a vaccine, we'll even have antiviral drugs, and all of a sudden we realize that life can go back to normal and, and then we'll all be extraordinarily optimistic. We want to travel, we want to um, go out, um, uh, and then basically celebrate life again to the point that uh, then, then we're going to see a new Roaring Twenties actually coming, uh, coming up. Um, I'm going to talk about actually uh, this also. I, I think we're not there yet. I don't think we're there, but we're probably closer actually to the best case scenario than to the worst case scenario. Uh, what are we currently? Uh, well, I think we have no idea, or maybe we do, or some people do, but generally we don't know very well. There is a lot of risk. The risk that uh, exists there is not, I guess, a risk that we can easily quantify, at least if we're not specialists. Um, it, it's mostly um, 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 a, a, a risk essentially of assessing this healthcare problem and, and then how to, to solve it. and then how we respond to it is actually by a lot of oversimplification. So any good news essentially then is extraordinarily good, the problem is solved. Any bad news is extraordinarily gloomy, nothing could be solved. And, and then so we're seeing a lot of volatility in markets, um, uh, partly because of this oversimplification um, and, and what people actually believe is uh, happening, uh, most likely of what traders actually believe it's happening. Uh, the, in terms of scenarios, actually, um, of the impact of the COVID-19 crisis, I guess, on real GDP of the U.S., um, the, the scenarios basically are somewhat bleak. Uh, I think we're putting them not to, the, uh, to as horrible as the Great Depression has been, uh, or even the, uh, uh, the beginning sort of the um, 19th century has been, but we're, we're putting them basically, uh, I'm sorry, on the 20th century has been has been, but we're basically putting them sort of close to, I guess, what happens when the World War II um, uh, stopped. So, so we're having sort of the same, we're seeing the sort, sort of same economic impact uh, there, um, I guess on average. But again, uh, these are all scenarios actually that, uh, that are quite unclear. Uh, where are we exactly? I mean, somewhere between those scenarios. Well, the, the, there's a couple of things that, that I guess to, I can say. The first thing is we can't stay home forever. Uh, if we stay home forever, uh, supply chains will erode uh, uh, in the sense that, so think about the meat industry, right? So, so basically um, one of the 
uh, links in the supply chain uh, faltered. So these are processing plants. Uh, and now the question is, how will basically the ends adapt? Will people start eating less meat? And at the same time, will farms produce less meat? Uh, if that is the case, then basically the meat industry is changed. The output is not going to be the same. And then even if the supply chains can be fixed, then the output is not going to be the same. So people will fundamentally question that, adapt their behavior, um, change their behavior, and, and then that part of the economy will shrink. Um, countries can implode. Uh, I mean, especially countries that I guess are parts of supply chain. So I'm thinking, for example, countries like Singapore. Um, so, so they depend on trade. If trade basically slows down, then this is a problem. Um, we'll see more phenomena like, uh, if you remember, the um, uh, negative oil prices. Um, and, um, and, and then um, what, what do I mean by new, by more phenomena like that? Well, Investing through exchange trading funds became very popular, so people like to buy indices. And then, uh, obviously, people like to buy assets that replicate an index without necessarily holding all the securities in an index. Now, these replication methods are working, I think, when markets are not uh, particularly stressed. But I think when markets are particularly stressed, then, then they don't. Right, so, um, so, so there's a very different thing uh, to hold physical oil, I guess, that is stored somewhere. And, and there is a very difficult, very different thing actually to hold um, an oil futures, uh, where somebody may push you actually uh, um, to take delivery and then you realize that, uh, that there's no place actually where to put it uh, anymore. Some, something that you haven't seen, I guess, when you bought that futures contract. So retail investing basically will be shaken from the perspective of, of these things. Markets will be stressed by a lot of volatility. Uh, and then from, uh, I guess, my, uh, the perspective of what I do for work, uh, universities will have empty dorms. And, um, um, and then, um, I mean, again, these dorms are built, for example, by universities issuing bonds. And, and then some of these bonds may default. In some cases, when a university issues bonds, then the university uses um, um, the endowment's assets to sort of back it, uh, to, to enhance the rate at which they borrow a little bit more. So as they default, then the endowment assets actually can suffer. Uh, so we'll see more special appropriations actually being done by, um, by universities. So we're not one of the universities actually that, that, um, that I think is in danger to, to that, of that. Uh, fortunately, so so we have a much more um, a cautious, I guess, endowment. I would say um, you can just open immediately. Um, um, it, it's difficult, so then you'll have liability issues. I mean, if you force the employees to come to work and then they get sick, then who's responsible for that? Uh, and then, of course, the I mean, if there's losses and then stress that accumulate, uh, if you force people to do things that could make them sick, then, then basically that can bring social unrest. I'm thinking about countries such as China, for example. So obviously, we need a plan or a treatment or a vaccine. Uh, where are we um, with with that? I guess with the um, um, on the plan side, um, uh, absent let's say a treatment and the vaccine. What can you do? Uh, well, you probably can hope, I guess, in mass immunity. We know that this virus, I guess, has been floating around um, for a while. So I guess uh, I was personally hoping that a lot of people actually are infected and have antibodies without even knowing that. But this is not what you see in the data. So what you see in the data is actually that on the high side, these numbers indicate that 20% of the population, I guess, nearly 20% of the population is infected. And I think that happens maybe in cities like New York. Um, and, um, and, and then I think in the US, experts put the number basically uh, at, at somewhere, I think, between uh, uh, 3 to 5%. So extraordinarily low. Remember that we need basically about 60%, I guess, immunity um, um, to, to have this uh, uh, method, this herd immunity method actually works, work, working. Um, you can think about testing, but um, uh, but this is very difficult actually to start. And uh, I'm sure that I'll, I'll actually get this wrong and that there's medical experts out there actually that can correct me, but this is my understanding of an antibodies test. So the test has two statistics. One is sensitivity. So out of all people actually who have antibodies, 
how much, what the, what's the percentage basically that the test actually captures as having antibodies. So let's say that there is a test that has a 99% sensitivity, which is good. And then there's a specificity number. So um, out of all everybody actually who doesn't have the antibodies, what percentage is the test basically then uh, uh, giving a negative result on antibodies? Right, so let's say that this number is 99%. Um, the specificity number is 99%, so that's also good, right? Now, if you have about 5% of the population actually that has truly antibodies, right, then the sensitivity actually will make sure that this 5% of the population is captured, but the specificity, which is not 100%, will also tell 6% of the population that they falsely actually have it, although they don't, right? So now, there's basically 11% of the population that's sort of told that they're having antibodies, but in reality, are you in the 5% that truly have it or you're in the 6% that don't? So it's a coin toss. That makes it extraordinarily difficult actually to start basically with antibodies test. And then the, I don't know how much evidence there is even that the antibodies test actually um, work. Um, so, so, so that seems extraordinarily, I, I mean, antibodies tests may be working, they may be great, but the question is, if I have antibodies, uh, then am I immune, Should, uh, will I not see, you know, subsequent infections and, and so on? So any measure basically seems to trigger actually then also a civil outcry on a plan. Um, I mean, look, for example, at asking people to get masks. I think somebody basically uh, got shot. Uh, on a controversy on whether they should be wearing a mask or not. Uh, so it's very difficult, at least in the United States, that seems to be very difficult. I'll, I'll come back actually to this point. Um, and then uh, planning basically on who can come out and start working and who may not, I guess, depending on the health conditions, that seems actually awfully complicated. And um, um, I, I think there's basically decision elements in this country that prefer bang bang solutions. We open the economy, we don't open the, or we stay home. So, um, so, so there's not a propensity actually to think through a very uh, well specified, clear, um, uh, detailed, I will say, uh, plan. Uh, what about treatment? Well, there's some promises. So uh, remdesivir, I guess, seems to from Gilead drugs that, that seems to to be work. But we we still can cure viruses, unfortunately. Uh, and then as we learn more, uh, there's better treatment uh, plans uh, coming along. Uh, now I don't know much about vaccines again uh, or anything medical, but uh, I've reached out actually to um, um, a, a VC venture capital firm that specializes in healthcare. Uh, they have a number of experts, I guess, working there. And then I was asking them, so what do you think about uh, a vaccine? So for FDA emergency use approval, right? So this is not, I guess, mass vaccinations from what I understand. It's just emergency use approval. This is what I've heard from these people. Uh, there's a 25% chance that we'll have a vaccine in 12 months. There's a 45% chance, basically 12 months to a year and a half. 25% uh, chance a year and a half to three years, and the 5% chance actually uh, that we won't have one within five years, they're saying. So, and, and then if we then have a vaccine, then how do we administer it? So, so this is sort of what we are um, um, in, in that uh, 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 sort of place. Now, how, what does that do actually to investing? Um, I'm just gonna talk uh, very briefly um, uh, you know, about some of the elements actually, uh, you know, of investments. What should you do? Should you cash out? Well, the argument actually against cashing out, uh, there's a few arguments actually against that. Uh, cashing out means that you'll try to time the markets uh, to a certain degree. And then you can say, well, uh, I can basically, I have a significant amount of money. I'll, I'm going to take all the money out and then basically then I'll wait on the side. Um, well, one of the uh, uh, points that I want to make is, uh, let's imagine that you've done that, but let's imagine that we actually see inflation along with economic decline. So if there's economic decline, then that's fine. It's a, it's a smart move that you've taken the money out, right? Um, but what if there's, um, uh, what if there's inflation? Uh, I, the best illustration is basically uh, what happened to my parents, uh, I guess when, uh, I, again, I'm from Romania. Um, so my parents saved money 
for most of their lives uh, in the hope that they will buy a house and then I will live in it actually um, uh, in Romania. So they have enough money to buy, uh, I think, a decent house. And then communism collapsed in Romania. We had economic decline, so they were somewhat happy actually that they still have money when there was economic decline. But then we had seen inflation actually creeping in at amazing rates. Eventually, um, my parents actually, with the cash basically being set aside, uh, were able to buy a, uh, a television set made in Russia, right? So from a house, they moved to a television set actually made in Russia versus other people who took the cash and then invested basically the cash in businesses or bought stocks because the Romanian, Romania was privatizing its economy. They've done actually fairly well. So you may think of cashing out, but if that's basically the kind of economic forces that will sort of make you happy that you cashed out, for example, economic decline, uh, then you might be missing inflation actually there. So that's um, right. So at, at least with inflation, stocks get adjusted a little bit. Um, I, I mean, some. The other thing is um, when will you take your market out, money out? Uh, you may miss basically the market rally. So as the markets will come back, you may be missing basically the best days actually of the markets, which happen to be obviously um, when the market is out of a slump, right? So um, how do you time that? Well, if you miss it, basically the effect is disastrous as in this essentially chart. So, so let's say that you put an amount of money, I guess in January 1, 1980, you, you put $10,000 basically in, in the markets and then you keep it, I think, until the end of 2019, I, what was this graph? You'll have 700,000 at the end of 2019. If you miss the best five days, just five days of the market, then you'll have 458,000. If you miss the 10 best days, you'll have half of the money that you'd otherwise have. So um, you want to time the markets. Basically, um, uh, that's not actually uh, that great. Do you want to wait for earnings, basically, or for the NBER to say we're out of recession to go back into the markets? That's also tough to do. Stocks traditionally move before earnings. They move before earnings, actually, when we're about to go into a recession. Remember that this market season, earnings basically were. Uh, coming actually after the market essentially fell by a lot. And then also they move uh, before the end of recession is announced, right? So, so market bottoms were in the recession for a little bit longer, but stocks actually then recover. So, so you'll be losing essentially uh, out on that. It, it's very difficult to time the market. No class of investors apparently can do it. If you look at what mutual funds do they can't do it if you look at what hedge funds do difficult even for hedge funds right these are the best paid investors to to time markets should you buy stocks um in the sense of let's say i'm i'm foreseeing essentially that that zoom will do well and and then i'm gonna buy zoom well it's more and more difficult actually to do that in the United States. So this graph that I have here shows the number of analysts, I guess stock analysts in the United States in, in red. And then it shows the number of reports that they basically um, uh, post per year um, uh, for a period of time. And then if you're looking actually sort of around 2009, 2010, the number of analysts basically declined and also the number of reports that they're putting out actually started to decline, right? And, and there's more actually here. So for example, if you're looking at the slope of the decline in number of analysts and slope of the decline in reports, analysts basically decline faster in number. So that means that there's fewer analysts they're putting out actually fewer reports, but even is these reports that they're putting out, basically analysts are more of overworked in the sense that one analyst is actually posting more things than they've actually done before, right? So what I'm getting to with this is that what you hear basically from analysts seems to be increasingly uninformative. Um, and I mean, this is not, not surprising. We, we've seen a move basically towards index investing, I guess, in the US. And, and then this move towards index investing then obviously um, is uh, uh, felt, I, I think, in security selection on, on stocks. Okay, so it's becoming very hard actually to identify companies that are uh, good. You have to do your own homework if you want. Um, you want to do it? 
I guess you can do it. So try to find stocks basically that have a high book to market basically numbers, <clears throat> ideally over one, if you ever find something like that, uh, that pay high dividends that don't have actually uh, uh, a lot of debt. And then if you want to speculate, I mean, you can still speculate. Uh, remember not to buy volatility when volatility is expensive, right? So, so for example, what's the, right? So uh, I'm going to give you an example. So um, <clears throat> uh, let's say that markets are low, volatility is high, and then I want to trade options basically to uh, essentially bet that the markets will come back up, right? I can do that in two ways through options. I can buy a call option. This is a bet basically that the markets will go up, right? So I can buy that option or I can sell a put option. That is, I can actually bet with somebody, sell a bet to somebody that the markets actually will uh, sell the bet that the markets will go down, right? So, or sell insurance to, through somebody. So in both cases, <laughs> these are bets that the market will go up. However, if volatility is high, which it is, I guess, when markets are down, if I buy a call, that call will be awfully expensive because the higher the volatility, the more expensive betting is. If I sell, on the other hand, the put, also that put will be expensive because, again, bets are expensive when volatility is up. I can actually generate money through that. Now, very few people actually have the stomach to sell, I guess, let's say, out of the money put options when, uh, when markets go down. But if you want to speculate, you should think about basically not to buy volatility when the volatility is high. So, so think about volatility in addition to... Um, uh, <clears throat> Um, you know, uh, taking basically a directional bet. Um, I'd say the best investment scenario is to stay put and then talk to your uh, uh, advisor, right? So if you think about it, uh, rebalancing to fixed weights uh, buys, I guess, when things essentially uh, are low and uh, sell, I guess, when things are high, just by, by the virtue basically of the of rebalancing to fixed weights. Um, and so that's not a, uh, a bad, uh, I guess, investment decision. But talk to your uh, advisor because, uh, you know, whatever you hear today, <clears throat> uh, things can become a lot more extreme, I guess, one week from today, um, positive or negatively extreme. Um, and, and so you have to keep an eye, actually, on, um, on investments. Um, what does well, I guess, when you have declining growth and inflation, so sort of that worst case scenario, well, utilities, basically consumer staples, food, for example. So pharma does well. I think sometimes real estate actually does well, but, but if it's levered real estate, then I'll, I'll be skeptical. So I would scratch the real estate actually uh, out of that. And then do not, do not forget actually that the market is somewhat slightly overvalued. It was somewhat slightly overvalued actually in 2019. So, um, um, you know, I, we had a little bit of a correction, I guess, happening. Um, I'd still sell that, st still stick to the point that equities basically are expensive. Um, Right, so that's a bit of a graph on, on what else, I guess, then fares, right? I think, reasonably well, right? So sectors that exhibited relative strength, um, you know, from fidelity, I mean, not surprisingly, healthcare, uh, communication services and technology. So this is a particularity of how we responded to the crisis, obviously, and then sectors essentially that were weak, obviously, energy, oil prices, materials less manufacturing and, and then real estate again, because if it's levered, then people actually have a hard time paying um, uh, you know, back the mortgages that they took uh, to acquire that real estate. Um, I wanna say actually a bit about, talk about the silver lining and what may be coming from this crisis. So um, some of the best companies actually were forged in times actually that were trying. So Uber was created in 2009 and out of the financial last financial crisis. Uh, Microsoft, basically 75, right? So the years of hyperinflation. Uh, Disney was created uh, basically in 1923, right? So, um, I mean, depression. Um, uh, Taobao, basically in China, uh, was created in uh, 2003, basically sort of in the midst of the SARS crisis uh, in that country. Uh, so it's not, uh, typical to expect a lot of creative destruction 
to take place. So one example actually that I really like, so AI artificial intelligence models, for example, on Amazon, um, uh, were actually sent sort of in a panic mode, but what people actually happen to buy um, uh, now, right? So from, let's say, you know, phone cases, I guess that was probably the most sold item on Amazon or something like that, then all of a sudden we moved to uh, Clorox wipes. Right, and uh, the question is, how do you predict what people basically want to buy, and and then show them actually what is it that they will buy? Um, so, so we'll, we'll see a lot. This is in some sense good news. So that says that we still need human input. Skynet is not taking over the world uh, just yet, right? So with a huge shock, AI basically obviously wasn't able to cope, wasn't trained to cope, uh, and then technology actually led and continues to be uh, uh, important. Um, I was surprised actually to realize that travel is not impossible. So people actually started to think about travel bubbles, right? So if city A and city B or country A and country B um, see very, uh, a very small number of uh, coronavirus cases, uh, you can actually travel and then basically um, uh, you know, trade, I, I think, between those regions. Right, so, so this will restart travel and then as travel will restart, then we'll basically understand how to fly uh, safely from a health point of view, and, and I think um, things basically were somewhat, um, you know, creep back to normality, I would say. Travel actually at the end of April was at 1978 levels, so um, I'm optimistic that it doesn't go away entirely, but on the other hand, uh, um, it, you know, uh, it, it was threatened. And, uh, and finally, gas prices actually are low, lower. So if you want to drive, for example, with an RV, well, that seems to be actually uh, cheaper than, um, than it was before. The other thing that I want to spend a bit of time about is talking about um, um, environmental, social, and governance um, in the COVID crisis. And I think that we will be seeing an emergence of S actually in ESG. Uh, this is a human crisis, um, but um, proposing actually human solutions um, is probably not, I guess, in the framework, sort of uh, mind framework, actually, I guess, in, right? So we value competition more as a country uh, than we value, uh, you know, a sense of, uh, of uh, community, right? So in order to solve, I guess, this crisis, we have to address more human issues. So we have to address healthcare and health insurance, we have to address unemployment, we have to address um, I don't know, daycare, and I think it's the companies actually with more success in these issues that will, um, I think, emerge uh, better uh, from this crisis. Uh, as I was saying, this is somewhat of an unusual mindset actually in the US. So health insurance is not much of a priority. Hospitals are optimized basically by procedures that generate dollars rather than basically, you know, being able to cope, I think, with a COVID-19 um, crisis. If you think about actually where the money in the CARES package went, if you divide by, I think, number of families, you get something like $50,000 per family. Uh, but then on the other hand, the family gets about 1,500. So the question is, I mean, where exactly is the rest going? I mean, why do you need essentially money for the CARES package? Well, because you laid people off and, and then these people basically need to be paid. I mean, that's the ultimate response. Well, what is the forty-eight, five hundred dollars basically going? At? It's supposed to go to people. Well, which people, right? So, um, so not the right um, help sort of everyone actually, uh, you know, uh, framework. Um, schools are closed, for example, to prioritize health. On the other hand, if you let the kids basically go to school, that's you know perfectly fine for the kids. They're not that much at risk. Um, uh, so the health issues basically are for the employees, I guess, in school, they manage basically, they're managing to stay at home. I'm a university professor, I can stay at home. That obviously fosters uh, inequality, right? So some people, right, so the, the grocery store clerk has to basically go show up to work, get exposed, uh, whereas I have the luxury to, to stay home. So clearly that fosters, in the short run, that fosters more, um, uh, more inequality. Um, and uh, very interestingly, actually, uh, that sort of speaks to this unusual mindset, basically, in the US, uh, is that if you actually look at number of new death cases today, so that's quite of a grim, actually, thing to say. So number of new deaths today, or number of um, 
or an increase in number of cases of coronavirus is actually today from yesterday, these numbers positively predict higher market returns tomorrow, okay? So the pessimism is not to, so I was thinking that this sign should be negative, right? So obviously more deaths should predict, more pes should be associated with more pessimism, lower market returns. Um, what, what you see actually is, uh, is the opposite. Now, there is a, obviously a mathematical explanation for that. So, so more infections basically, or deaths predict essentially more need to lock down, more needs for technology, and, and then the technology companies basically lead the market and, and then in some sense then you see higher market returns but this is a statistic that is nevertheless uh, 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 worrisome and then so staying home basically deepens inequality actually in the, in the short term um, indeed um, so I was talking about the emergence of S the, the social in I guess in ESG uh, we've seen basically more movement actually uh, towards workers rights right so again I mean around healthcare, around basically maybe the ability to uh, get uh, unemployment benefits. And uh, markets actually seem to take that into account. So this is a graph uh, done by a hedge fund called Just Capital. So Just Capital look at, largest, at the largest companies in the Russell 1000. And um, they are basically sorting these companies based on how do they respond to um, um, I mean, essentially, the, how, how happy the workers are uh, and uh, what is it that they're doing for the workers. So if they're doing a lot for the workers, these companies rank high. If they're not, then these companies rank low, right? So for example, I mean, think about Microsoft, I guess. You can basically take maternity leaves and, and whatnot, and the working conditions are great. And you think about uh, Tyson Foods, right? That... Uh, you know, I mean, working conditions are such that basically, you know, people can get sick and, and so on. Well, it turns out that uh, that the ones actually who treat the workers better actually have done better in this crisis, right? So, for example, look at the spikes uh, in here. So the ones who treat the workers better, they basically spiked up, I guess, when coronavirus hit. The ones that treat the treating the workers the worst, basically, the returns actually the value spike low. Uh, when the coronavirus virus hit. So this is an emergence basically of S, right, in the ESG. I think we, we would love more or like more the companies that have a better S record, right? We will do deal with the banks that did not fire, I guess, our friends. Uh, we will buy basically our meat from companies actually that did not pack people together so that they could get sick and, and then so on. Um, so happier employees basically will we make for better wages, I guess, and then in the long run, actually, this will lead to less inequality. This is not the first time, actually, when a pandemic um, has positive effects for workers' rights. Uh, we've seen this, actually, in the Great Plague, I guess, so the population was decimated to such a degree that workers essentially got more uh, bargaining uh, power uh, and then essentially got more, more rights and then higher wages. So human life, I guess, will be appreciated at a higher value. The working conditions will be better. Maybe the healthcare actually will get better, and then uh, we'll have better incentive alignment actually in uh, in healthcare as well. Uh, universities, I guess, will have to transform in this crisis. So higher education will be revalued. I think people actually will be a lot more careful on what the value is. I think for higher education. Um, uh, free student money, for example, I guess will probably have to come, student loan money will come to an end. Um, essentially, this, this um, uh, encourage universities actually to sort of fluff up and, and then basically you know, uh, increase. I think then we'll go back and then reevaluate that model a lot. Um, up until now, we'll deliver, we would deliver education to a student and then grade their work. Um, I think there has to be a more, I mean, a tighter partnership. So students will have to be our friends. We'll have to feel more responsible for the jobs that will find them. I think um, maybe we'll charge tuition actually that is proportional to the salary at graduation. I, I don't know exactly what the, the model basically will change, but but universities actually will uh, will have to change, I think, after this uh, virus. And then finally, faculty actually will be forced to bridge the technology gap. 
right? So uh, my daughter uses TikTok. I've learned actually what TikTok is. Never heard of it before. And it sounds actually cool. Maybe I should TikTok myself, I guess, in some of the courses that I teach. And then finally, online uh, teaching technology, basically adoption will speed up. Um, so I, I guess all, um, I think silver lining essentially and creative destruction as the effects of this crisis. Um, I'll stop here um, and, um, and see if there's uh, questions that um, I can get asked. Excellent. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Tiu. This has been excellent information. Really um, glad you were able to take some time with us uh, to share all of your knowledge and expertise uh, surrounding this topic. We do have a question that has come in, um, possibly from one of your uh, past students, because they do say hello, and it was great to see you, they said. Um, so I'll start with that. But the question um, that they have, um, they have witnessed several mortgage uh, real estate investment trusts uh, missed their margin calls during this pandemic. What is your outlook in the real estate market? Well, uh, I was having a slide, I think, a bit earlier, uh, talking about the essentially real estate um, working as a good hedge, I guess, um, um, I mean, for inflation. Um, and then I was, um, I think, saying scratch, basically, that real estate um, uh, line, um, because I think there's going to be actually defaults, not just on, I think, on the side of basically the, the people that are. Uh, so, so, so my outlook is, is not externally favorable. Um, and, and then the reason is, um, if I basically levered myself to buy a property and then, let's say, filled it with apartments, uh, but if people actually can make the rent payments, um, that facility will suffer. Basically, I won't be uh, able to pay my mortgage. Um, so then, therefore, then I'll, I might be forced actually to sell that property, and uh, and then the prices basically will go lower. Um, the same thing goes about um, I don't know, just a normal mortgage. So I bought my house. Maybe I can't pay my mortgage. Then I'm forced actually to sell the house. That will depress uh, real estate prices. So I see real estate prices basically going, um, um, I mean, I don't have a favorable outlook on that. Now, on the other hand, I was looking actually at um, the sort of perver perverse opposite effect uh, that I've seen sort of back in Romania. So back in Romania, real estate prices basically fell, but on lar in large cities, real estate prices actually went up. Um, why? Well, one effect would be I realize that I have to stay home. Therefore, I need basically a home that um, I like to live in. And then I realize that maybe I don't. So then probably I trade up. So for a very sliver, small sliver, I think, then, then you see that perverse effect. But I think my outlook is not uh, favorable. Excellent, thank you. That looks like the um, the only formal question that's come in. Some comments have um, just wanted to thank you, um, Professor to you that we've seen come through. Um, thank you for sharing the visuals somebody mentioned, very helpful. Um, so really appreciate uh, your time with us today. Um, on behalf of the Office of Alumni Engagement, on behalf of the UB School of Management and the entire UB community, again, thank you so much uh, for sharing all of this great um, knowledge uh, with so many UB alums across the world. And as a reminder, we have recorded today's session. We're going to send everyone the link within the next 24 hours. So just check your email box uh, for the recording. In addition, you're going to receive links to, to our webinar archive library and also our website listing all of our upcoming webinars. And speaking of upcoming webinars, we're going to be joined by um, Gwen Applebaum on Monday, May 18th, UB alumna. She's the Assistant Dean and Director of the UB School of Management's Career Resource Center. And she's gonna share some tips and strategies for successful outreach in a virtual environment. And you'll make time to focus on one of your most priceless assets, your network. So please plan on joining us on Monday for that. In addition, we just wanna say we welcome the class of 2020 this weekend into our alumni family. Um, we will be recognizing all of their many successes through some virtual commencement ceremonies. So wanna wish all of our class of 2020 
uh, this weekend. Um, best wishes as they do uh, leave their UB uh, uh, grounds and enter our UB family. So with that said, I'll turn it back to uh, Christian to you for any closing remarks. Uh, sure. Well, I'll be happy actually to, uh, I mean, get as you're thinking about these things. Uh, if you found this informative to a degree or confusing, then I'll be happy to get more questions, I guess, through email um, as well after that. And then, of course, your alumni, once classes are over and then once you graduate, it doesn't mean that the educational process stops for either you or me. Um, so stay friends, I guess, and stay in touch. Fantastic. Thank you so much, uh, Professor to you. Really so grateful. We'll share your email address when we email all of the attendees tomorrow. That way, if they do think of any additional questions, they can send you a quick note. And you're correct, you know, lifelong learning um, and lifelong education um, is definitely key to success um, in our lives. So thank you again. I hope everyone stays well. Enjoy your weekend. We are you Buffalo Strong. So uh, take care. Thank you. Have a good weekend.